Well, we're going to take a little bit of a break from Romans today, and we're going to take into uh, account uh, our, our current events, you might say, with the uh, uh, invasion of Russia and Ukraine. And we're going to take a look at some prophecy that's in Scripture today. Uh, so we're kind of looking at, you might say, current events. But we might want to uh, just state uh, right here that we're not going to necessarily interpret the Scripture by the current events. Uh, but we're going to jump off using the current events, okay? Now, we live in a day of great, great turbulence, especially as we receive news of the disturbing events of Taiwan, with China flying over Taiwan and entering their airspace. Ukraine, obviously, that's in the news. And as well as the Middle East, that never seems to go away as far as trouble goes. Russia has been aiding Syria and Iran with knowledge advisors and military hardware for years. There have been sales of anti-missile batteries to Iran from Russia with complete enabling of Iran to protect its nuclear installations. North Korea has helped Iran to conduct nuclear tests. High-ranking Ayatollahs have stated that the United States has to be taken out of the picture uh, before Iran can actually make good on its pledge to actually wipe Israel off the map. Israel's destruction has been part of their agenda for 1948, ever since then, possibly. Hamas and Fatah, Fatah have been convinced of Israel's destruction. For them, it's just a matter of time. Russian intelligence has all but taken over the town of Sidon in southern Lebanon and advises Hezbollah, Lebanon, Syria, and Iran on Israel's defense forces and troop movements. Many qualified observers expect Israel and Iran conflict to flare up again and again and again until there's actually a flat out war. Both Syria and Russia and Iran appear ready to actually take part when the time is right. There seems to be a coalition that has developed over the years of nations that really want to destroy America, and it's not only Iran, but that would include China, Russia, North Korea, along with several Mid-Eastern countries. And they could possibly one day attack the United States. Some of these nations have ongoing nuclear development, some of these with high-powered missiles uh, of able to actually, intercontinental actually, to get here, uh, even though we're quite a distance from them. But there is a coalition that will attack Israel. Is this the stage being set for end time events? That's a good question to ask. That's a really good question to ask. So I would like to take a look at an Old Testament passage that has prophecy in relating to uh, some aspects uh, of what we're seeing today. So let's take a look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel, and we are going to be looking at the entire chapter, and so I'm not going to have you stand because it's just a little bit too long for you. So bear with me if you uh, are able to take a look at Ezekiel 38, and we'll read through this section, and then we'll kind of go back and readdress some areas. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophecy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, and prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will 
turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields of all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shields and helmets. Gomer and its troops, the house of Togarma uh, from far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourselves and be ready, uh, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be on guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely." You will ascend coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, and all your troops and your people with you. Thus saith the Lord God, O oh, that day it shall come to pass that uh, those will rise in your mind, thoughts will rise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up and against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having uh, neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are against inhabited, that again inhabited, and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Sheba, Dedan, merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, and to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus saith the Lord God, on the day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, all of them riding on horses and great company of mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. I will be in the latter days, it will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servant, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, uh, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken. Surely in that day, there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel so that the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the field, all creeping things and creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the mountain, on the many people who are with him, flooding rains, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus, I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations that they shall know that I am the Lord. What an amazing passage of scripture this is, isn't it? included in a section of scripture that deals with Israel's blessing is a description of the deliverance of Israel from invaders that actually come from the far north who are led by Gog, G-O-G. Now this prophecy against Gog is one of the most dramatic predictions of Ezekiel. And many details of this prophecy are not entirely clear. Therefore, some people think that this is actually symbolic. Many godly scholars have somewhat differing views, but the main thrust of this prediction in Ezekiel is not difficult to understand. Really, I think it's 
pretty plain, and it, anyone here can probably decipher, that the Lord is going to protect his people Israel. That's the thrust of this whole thing, right? He's going to protect these people. And this passage predicts an invasion of Israel by a great army that will attack Israel from the far north. And to be specific, there is a northern confederacy of nations who will invade the promised land. And this is not symbolism. This is something that will literally take place. Now, to help us understand this prophecy, I want you to consider this. This passage is a part of the great world conflict which will characterize the years just before the second coming of Christ. So read with me Matthew 24, 6 through 8, and it says this. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Sound familiar? Now listen carefully. False prophets, as well as wars and rumors of wars, have characterized this whole church age. And that started with Jesus Christ to the very present. This is the church age. And it has been characterized by many false teachings, many false prophets, and we've had rumors of wars, and we've had war upon war upon war that has not gone away for at least 2,000 years. And within the last 150 years or so, we've had some humdingers, right? They've been horrible. But toward the end of the age, these things will escalate, escalate. And that's why I mentioned the last 150 years or so, we've seen these things really escalate. And I want to take a look at one passage here that's found in 2 Timothy 3.13. And it says, Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. One of the evil men at the end of the age is referred to in our text as Gog. Now don't get confused. I didn't say God. I'm saying Gog, G-O-G. And the military invasion is described as led by Gog, referring to its leader, and the land of Magog, referring to the territory from which will come this leader. Now, it's interesting that the name Gog is found in 1 Chronicles 5.4 as the son of Shemaiah. So 1 Chronicles uh, it says this, the son of Joel were Shemaiah, his son, Gog, his son. And while the scriptures in the Greek Old Testament translation of the Old Testament uses Gog, it renders this name for Agag and Og. And so in the Old Testament Greek translation, you'll see Agag and Og as Gog. So you're totally confused? The point is, Gog is used as a proper name, but it's also used as an enemy of Israel. So Gog is used as a proper name, but it's also used both ways as an enemy of Israel. Gog and Magog are also used in Revelation 20, verse 8. So we're going all the way from Ezekiel, now we're going way to the end of the scriptures, to a whole different time period. And I want to read Revelation 28. And we'll go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, 
to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sands of the sea. And it's very, it's very possible that people get these things confused. Very possible. Because these are used in Revelation uh, of a world uprising against Jerusalem and its people and the Messiah, the King, at the end of the millennium. So, so here's what we have. Gog and Magog as terms used for the enemies of God for two different assaults on Israel at two different times in history. In Revelation, the attacks comes not from the far north, but from the four corners of the world. And these little details are very important, aren't they? To understand Scripture correctly. These are coming from the four corners of the world. And the weapons used here are fire in this particular text in Revelation. And it follows uh, the final judgment uh, of the unsaved. So Revelation and Ezekiel are two different events that use the same identical names. They use the same identical names. Magog is referred to as one of the sons of Japheth, one of the three sons of Noah. First Chronicles 5.4. The sons of Joel were Shemaiah. Oh, we not, that's the wrong, wrong one. First Chronicles 1 Chronicles 1.5. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, and then the rest of the crew. <laughs> Some see Magog as a people derived from Japheth who were later called Scythians, who coalesced and immigrated to a small bands in the regions of south of the Black Sea. Others see Magog as an overall term for barbarians north of Palestine around the Caspian and Black Sea. Still others see Magog as a people in southeast Anatolia, later known as uh, Asiatic people, such as Mongols and Huns. In any case, all these views put these people either in modern-day Turkey or modern-day Russia. That's the area. That's the area. So there might be a little bit of variations on a theme here, but the area is almost consistently identified as the Black Sea area. And so you might have these people both in Turkey and in Russia, which I believe is the case. You have these people that actually settled, ancient people that settled in these lands and just simply developed. One thing that's really interesting to me, though, is Russia is in prophecy and she is an aggressive invader. That's one thing we can see in Scripture. That's a generality we can just simply state and say, yep, that's in the Bible. Russia is in prophecy, and she is an aggressive invader. Now, I want you to consider this. In the time period since World War II, Russia has risen to be one of the great military powers of the modern world. To a far greater extent than even before, Russia has become a prominent nation, especially in its influence of the Middle East. With both Russia and Red China uh, constituting a major political bloc. With the hostile Muslim nations in the Middle East, a future war between a northern confederacy of nations with Russia coming down through Turkey leading the way has become a real possibility. Now this would fit our text as far as a northern invasion goes. 
Now let's look at some of our text again, and let's begin at verse 2, as God's future uh, uh, further describes his enemies here. So here we are, verse 2. The Son of Man set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Okay, now, Gog apparently will lead a force from the land of Magog. God is, Gog is further described as the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, again, we have conflicting views. We have conflicting views. Some have translated this section that I just read, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And the reason is, is because the word rosh, more than 600 times in the Old Testament, is the adjective chief. So they translated it that way. Rosh is not listed as a third people, and the two people, Meshach and Tubal, were recognized uh, on an ancient Assyrian monument, one called Mishki and the other Tubali. Both were in Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey area. Other Bible translators give us the prince of Rosh, which I read for you today being the root of modern-day Russia, and Meshach and Tubo being variations in the spelling of Moscow and Tobolik, an area of the Euro section of Russia. Now, I simply cannot determine which is the correct interpretation. I just don't have the knowledge for that. So I'm not going to draw final conclusions here. I just don't know. I've looked up a couple of people that are far more knowledgeable than I am, and J. Vernon McGee, an old, an, an old preacher from way back, states that the word gog, G-O-G, is a Tartaric word that means roof. It means the person who's on the top. And this certainly would be a picture of a dictator or a very strong a dominating person. And at the present, Turkey has such an individual in its leaders, but Putin in Russia has definitely moved into that particular slot. And this is a fascinating possibility, but by no means provable that this fits into the exact thing here. But this we do have, this we can know. We have Gog, and Magog being a, pip, a, a people, we simply don't know the exact pinpoint spot, but we do know that they're from the Black Sea area. That we can know. Now, the prediction of Ezekiel 38 pictures God as putting hooks into the jaws of Gog and leading him and his armies from the north against Israel. And so me, let me read Ezekiel 38, 4 and 5 again. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, of all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with you, all of them with shields and helmets. Okay, the, the, both Russia and Turkey are to the north of Israel, but Russia is of the far north to Israel. So many of the prophecies that you see in Scripture all deal with Israel. Okay, and for 2,000 years we know that there wasn't an Israel, but we now know that there is an Israel. We've all mentioned it several times, 1948, Israel becomes a nation. So there's a great deal of prophecy that now can be fulfilled that for 2,000 years could not be fulfilled. And that's why a lot of your prophecy people have actually run these alarms when Israel became a nation because prophecies like Ezekiel can now take place. So the invitation involves a coalition of powers from the east 
and south of Palestine. Persia is easily identified as modern-day Iran. In some of your translations, you will come across the word Kush, which is believed to be Sudan and northern Ethiopia. You'll also sometimes read Put is believed to be Libya. Gomer is thought to be the area of Armenia and Tugarma, eastern Turkey. So we have Iran, Sudan, Libya, Ethiopia, and Turkey. Now, all these, all these nations are not located to the north of Israel. They're not. And it's not too difficult to understand, though, that these nations would participate in a major invasion from the far north dominated by Gog and Magog, or a Russian leader and his people. The prophecy reveals that a great horde will come mounted on horses with horsemen fully armed with shields and swords and helmets and additional weapons including bows and arrows and spears. And I'll read uh, from chapter 39. It says, Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go, will go out and set fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and arrows and javelins and spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years years. Now, much speculation has arisen that ancient weaponry is contemporary with Ezekiel's day and not modern day. And I do not have a specific explanation as to why the use of ancient weaponry here. I do know that Russia today has troops on horses as part of the military operation, and they are very effective in traveling in mountainous regions, which is where this battle will be fought. I also know that it's sometimes hard to get fuel to modern weaponry and its vehicles. I do know that the uh, sophisticated bows and arrows were actually used in the Vietnam War, and they were used very, very effectively. I also know that knives of varying lengths are still used in every modern-day army today, as well as helmets. So I personally don't have a problem taking these weapons literally. Also, I don't see these as being a complete list of every weapon used. The point is, the invading horde is fully equipped and prepared for war. That's the point. However, the people that they are attacking are not. So we look at, again, our text. We're going to take a look at Ezekiel uh, 38, 7 and 8. And it says, prepare yourself and be ready. And all your company that are gathered about you, and be on guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. I want you to know that the army is described as a great horde which will invade a land that has been restored from previous desolation, 7 and 8. And the invaders are quoted as saying in 10 and 13, I will invade a land if, uh, with unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates. Okay, that's what it says. And I don't know about you, but this is not the Israel that I know. This is not the Israel that I know today. There is a great wall that has been erected to go around Jerusalem. There is, uh, Israel uh, has not had peace since its existence. It's always seemed to be on the verge of war, as well as equipped and prepared to defend itself to the max. Israel is described here as a territory 
recovered from war or brought back from the sword, verse 8, which fits how Israel came into existence after World War II. And they were gathered from many nations. So there's people who have been filing into this land, this area of land that we call Israel, from all over the world. This is not quite the Israel of today, but could be the Israel of tomorrow. Now, I want you to allow me to paint a possible scenario. This is a possible scenario. It would not surprise me if Israel makes a preemptive strike on Iran's nuclear facilities. Why do I say that? Because Israel has said it over and over and over again. We are not going to allow Iran to have nuclear weapons, period. And they have not only said it once, they have said it many, many times. What does Iran continue to do? Build up nuclear abilities. So it would not surprise me, somewhere down the line, if Israel makes a preemptive strike against nuclear facilities, touching off a major conflict between Syria, Lebanon, and Hezbollah, as well as Iran. Or the other scenario could be this. Iran makes a preemptive strike on Israel that actually uh, uh, sets off or triggers a regional conflict as Israel defends itself again, depleting her arsenal on Syria, Lebanon, and Iran, with Israel licking its wounds and the other countries trying to recover, I would not be surprised to see Europe, NATO, somebody of that particular persuasion, step up and halt the fighting and impose a peace treaty in the region. Now this is pure conjecture. Did you get that? This is pure conjecture. But the word of God is not conjecture. Now, why this scenario? Why this particular scenario? Well, the cities of Israel are described as unwalled and peaceful and an unsuspecting people. They're sitting in the land of Israel. It's described as resettled ruins, verse 12, waste places that are again inhabited by people said to have been gathered from the nations. This is the people Israel. And all this fits naturally into the end time events and situations where Israel is in supposed security and peace under a peace treaty with a strong ruler that has been prophesied as the little horn in Daniel 7, 8. So let me just read Daniel 7. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, from before whom three of the horns were plucked out by the roots. And there is this horn, where eyes like eyes of a man, and mouth speaking pompous words. Okay, so you're going to have this individual rise into power. Very pompous person, very strong leader. We recognize him as the Antichrist. The scripture predicts a future period with a seven-year covenant is made between the ruler of what we believe to be the Roman sphere, who is the Antichrist, and Israel, Daniel 9, 27. There shall be confirmed a covenant with many for one week, a seven-year period of time. A significant event that will mark the beginning of the seven-year period called the tribulation with the confirming of a covenant. This covenant will be made with many, that is, with Daniel's people, the Jews, and it could include their enemies as well. The ruler, 
the prince who is to come, Daniel 9, 26. Let me just read that. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end shall be with a flood till the end of the war desolation is determined. Now, we know that Jesus Christ is cut off. We know that Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. But the people of the prince who is to come, who's the prince to come? The little horn, the Antichrist. He's going to come on the scene. And he will be the covenant maker in which he will guarantee Israel's safety in the land. We now have the setting for the invader from the north. Israel is at peace. They are unsuspecting. They have the guarantee of who? The little horn, the Antichrist. And we believe that this will probably put this prophecy of Ezekiel in the first half of the tribulation and possibly at the beginning of thereabouts because they're burning their weapons for seven years. That would have to put it where? At the beginning of the tribulation. Now we can't know for sure, but this, descri but this describes the peace in Israel during the period of the Antichrist short limited treaty with them and how Israel will become an unsuspecting target of Gog and Magog and the rest of the invaders. Now, from the invaders' perspective, they intend to seize the spoil and wealth of Israel. Verse 12 of our text. From God's perspective, he puts hooks in the jaws and brings them down to Israel. And an ancient way of actually transporting prisoners or those who had been conquered was to actually put a hook into the base of the chin, puncture the chin so that it comes out of the mouth and then drag them along. And I tell you, they would have a whole string of people with hooks in their chins coming out of their mouths and they would just string them together and you could have one person just tugging on the way and you could have a whole string of prisoners and cart them. You see, they didn't treat prisoners like we treat prisoners. They didn't treat conquered people like we treat people who've been in wars. They, they took them by hooks and they pulled them along. And God uses that analogy, that picture, and how he is going to hook these people and bring them down to Israel. God ultimately is the one who's leading Israel's enemies to Palestine that he will and he will destroy them. But going back to the invaders, what are they coming down for? Why are they there? Well, it says booty that they are going to be going after. And what booty are they going after uh, from the promised land? In verses 12 and 13, they have livestock, goods, silver, and gold. Now, I know that Russia has a great desire for a warm water port and has made several attempts to getting one. And they might actually succeed if they can get to Palestine along the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. It would be a great prize if they actually could get it. As of now, I know for a fact that Israel has discovered large, large amounts of natural gas. Matter of fact, they call their field Leviathan. That's what they call their gas field, Leviathan. So Israel has wealth. It has wealth. The Lord said, I'll put a hook in you and bring them down into this land. I also know 
that the Lord has been depositing minerals into the Dead Sea for thousands of years. And it is said, the things that have been deposited into the Dead Sea are worth trillions of dollars. Just in potash, just in that which fertilizes plants. In that alone, trillions of dollars are in the Dead Sea. I also know that Israel has developed lush plants from drip irrigation systems that direct water flow straight into the root system of these plants. They have developed uh, uh, one of, uh, they have developed uh, very interesting plants that are, are actually adaptable to salt water. They've actually made plants that can live in salt water. And I also know that there's going to be in the seal judgments that ride out of, uh, that come right at the very beginning of the uh, seals in Revelation, there's going to be a great need for food because there's a black horse coming. And what comes with the black horse? Famine. Famine. Revelation 6, 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Well, you know, we've seen all kinds of things rise in our day, haven't we? You know, I don't know what the price of gas was when you were young, if you were young. When I was young, it wasn't four or five dollars a gallon. It wasn't that, believe me. And you could pick up food that's nowhere near the cost of it is now. Now imagine if you now are entering into conflict after conflict after conflict after conflict. And they've talked about Ukraine. Ukraine has tremendous wheat fields. And that country's being bombed over and over. Do you think the farmers can get in and do their fields? So if they're the breadbasket of part of Europe, what's going to happen to Europe? What's going to happen to food? In Ezekiel 38, 12 and 13, I noticed that the invaders plan to take away gold, silver, and livestock. At the present, Israel dairy cows, on average, are the world champions in milk production. And they have made their animals more adaptable to harsh and variation climate changes. Little unsuspecting Israel will look like a plush, ripe fruit tree that is begging to be picked Israel is also a very strategic target for any power that's wanting to control commerce between Asia and Africa. It's right there in the right strategic place. The Lord says, I'll put hooks in their jaws and bring them down into the land. Israel's enemies will be enticed by God. God will put in their heads that Israel is both vulnerable and valuable. And he will bring them down. Standing by and circling around like vultures anticipating death will be Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish. It's believed Dedan and Sheba were people of Arabia representing land trade, while Tarshish represented sea trade. So while not, while not disposed to take any active part in the invasion, they are ready to cheer on the invaders' success and are anxious about the economic ventures that might result from this whole, this whole invasion. Now with this we see that God's patience will be utterly exhausted. Utterly exhausted. So we look at Ezekiel 38, 18 through 22, and it says this. 
And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, said the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the field, all creeping things, all all creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, said the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. And I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on many people who are with him, flooding rains, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Well, it's clear that this invasion will arouse the hot anger of God. Have you read often in Scripture, my face will, my fury will show in my face? That's how God describes it. And so you're going to have the hot anger of God and a series of disasters that will take place. And Hebrews 10.31 comes to mind. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, people can laugh at that all you want, but I don't want to be there. I don't want to be the one who falls into the hands of the living God. So first, there will be a great earthquake that shakes the land. This quake will be so great that it will affect the fish, the birds, the beasts, and all creatures on the ground. Mountains will be that these, uh, this army is marching through. They're marching through this area. They'll be overturned. They'll be overturned. And walls and buildings, everything's going to fall down. Walls of the mountain, walls of rock. The next great judgment of God will introduce a confusion in the multinational army, and they'll begin to fight each other in verse 21. A third judgment is brought on the army in the form of plagues. And if you've read the plagues of Egypt, you know how devastating they can be. And on top of these problems will come the outpouring judgment of God in the form of floods, hailstones, and burning sulfur in verse 22. Now, can you imagine... The mudslides, the hailstorms, pelting away at this advancing army with nowhere to run for cover. The great earthquake might wake dormant volcanoes that will spew out the hot lava or rock burning people alive. Listen, what I'm saying here is this invading army is going to be decimated. Absolutely decimated. And the nature of these judgments will demonstrate to all the greatness of God. Many nations will recognize this and act uh, that this is an act of God and not nature. Verse 23 says, Then they shall know that I am the Lord. The events that we have been studying are yet future. But at this point, I would like to stop and I'd like to ask you this. Is it possible that as we view the Middle East and the current events of today, Russia, Turkey, Iran, that the stage is being set for these end time events? Is it possible as Bible believers and students, we are witnessing God's setting the stage. And I believe we can say, yes, it is possible that we are now seeing on the world stage today all the pieces of the prophetical puzzle being put in place. While we don't know exactly how each piece will fit with the overall picture, God continues to move his purposes and plans forward. Nothing is stagnant. Nothing is stagnant. History is marching to a point. 
It's just not going around and round in circles and we're learning nothing from it. God is taking history and it's bringing it somewhere. And it's going to bring it to exactly what he says in his word. At some point, these pieces will fall into place and we are one step closer, one day closer, one hour closer to God's call. What call? 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump will sound, and the dead will rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Are you ready for the trumpet sound? Don't get complacent. Don't get apathetic. Don't get lazy. Don't get fearful. And don't get disbelieving as though the rapture will not take place in our lifetime. Paul was looking for the imminent return of Christ in his day, and we need to be looking for the eminent return of Christ in our day. We have got to be that much closer than Paul's day. What do you think? The rapture of the church looms as an imminent event that will occur before the events that we have been discussing today. There has never been a more reason than there is now for the Lord's people to expect the imminent return of Christ for them. And while we cannot, and I'm going to stress this really, really again, while we cannot interpret Scripture by current events, don't do that. And that's not what I'm trying to do. Don't interpret Scripture by current events. There are events predicted by God that will take place exactly how he has stated in his word. While I may not have everything perfectly understood, what I have given you today is not an outside chance. It's not outside the realm of possibility, nor is it outside Bible prophecy that God will fulfill before the very end times and his return. Because he has promised to come back. He is going to come for his church and he's going to come to rule and reign on this earth. It will take place. And as believers and as many others who are outside looking in, we can say from with authority, that these end time events will take place. So whether you believe it or whether you don't believe it is up to you. I cannot make you believe anything. But God has been faithful to his word for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And he's not about to stop now. So what he has predicted will take place. And we have some major players that are now in the world scene so many of the things that we've talked about today can take place and how quickly things can change, how quickly these events might occur. So look up and be ready. Let's pray. Well, my Father, thank you once again for this time. We can take a look at a very interesting prophetical uh, passage of Scripture. And Lord, there's many things we cannot know. Maybe there's things we are understanding wrongly. So I pray that the Spirit of God will help us to know things correctly. And Lord, if there's anything here that is said wrongly today, that it'll simply be forgotten. If there are things that are correct, I pray that they will be remembered. And Lord, I just pray that these things will now begin to shape and mold our minds to help us to think clearly about what you have said. And I'm so grateful for each and every one who's here today. I do want to pray that everyone here today 
truly knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, for he has many, many promises for us, and they will come to fruition. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen.